Okay, welcome everybody to the symposium. Um, of course, the Eye of the Storm is a phenomenal exhibition, which I'm looking forward for you to see shortly afterwards. But it was decided um, to create a symposium specifically with all the experts that have been part of the curatorial um, body that have put together this exhibition. All of them are from Ukraine. Um, and we were approached by the European Cultural Foundation, whose patron is Her Royal Highness, Princess Laurent from the Netherlands. I'm really, I knew I would make a mess of that. Sorry, sorry. Um, and together, Museums for Ukraine, um, the European Cultural Foundation and Tissim Bonamica uh, National Museum have also decided that this was a very opportune moment to create a call for a European cultural deal for Ukraine. And this is what the second panel will be about. But unfortunately, um, we have only a video from the Royal, Her Royal Highness and we will run that video and then we will start the symposium right away because there are many speakers over the next two hours. Thank you very much. Esteemed friends, welcome to the exhibition in the eye of the storm, modernism in Ukraine, 1900-1930s. As president of the European Cultural Foundation, it gives me great pleasure to say a few words. We were founded in 1954 with the aim to foster Europe through arts and culture, to bring together people around shared values and shared aspirations, and to inspire a European sentiment to imagine a future together. Now today's crisis reminds us that we cannot take this for granted. And today's crisis reminds us that we must stand together to fight for peace, for solidarity, for democracy. So the question is what can artists do and what can culture do in times of crisis, realizing it is only a drop in the ocean, but still, Artists can be drivers for change. They create spaces to rethink, to reflect, and to reimagine re a future. They give hope in times of anxiety. A few days after the beginning of the war in Ukraine, we created the Ukraine edition of the Culture of Solidarity Fund. And since then, we've supported over 100 projects. Let us remember that in times of crisis, artists need investing, they need support, and we need to remember that also in times of crisis, arts and culture have a place. We wish you a very good and inspiring exhibition, and please remember the words of Robert Schumann, one of our founders of the European Cultural Foundation. Now he said, World peace cannot be safeguarded without the making of creative efforts proportionate to the dangers which threaten it. It is from the 9th of May, 1950, in the Schumann Declaration. Let's remember that arts and culture need our support. Enjoy the exhibition. I'm just going to uh, introduce the speakers in this first panel. So we will have as a moderator, uh, moderator the curator of the co-curator of this exhibition, which is um, Constantine um, Akinso. We also have Katia Denisova, co-curator of the exhibition, that will also be part. She has been a co-curator, but she will be one of the members of the first panel. And then we also have 
Olena Kashuba Bolbach, the other curator, the third curator, and she's part of the um, 19th and 20th century uh, department of the National Art Museum of Ukraine. And with this three, the three curators of the exhibition, we also have Irina Drobot, uh, the director of the Museum of Theater, Music and Cinema of Ukraine. She has also contributed a lot. There's a great second part of the exhibition full of incredible pieces from the collection of this museum. And Elena Honcharuk, head of the Dovsenko Center, which is a library and a center for research on cinema and photography in Kyiv. And uh, thank you very much. I'm going to leave the floor to our different speakers. And my intention is to give you some real taste <laughs> of what does it mean to run museums in Ukraine today? What does it mean to prepare exhibitions during the war? Uh, and I will start with our colleagues who did it, who were there, who were in Kyiv uh, under the bombs and missiles. And I want to, even by myself, I have to have better understanding of uh, the reality which they experienced. I think that we will start with Elena, who is our co-curator and who was doing an unbelievable job in the museum. She was working with us also on the book which was published by Tamlin Hudson. That was in horrible private situation, which I don't want to mention because she's a shy person. She don't want to go into the private stuff. I want to ask Elena how this preparation was going in the museum uh, in this uh, difficult uh, and uh, challenging time. Я хотів би спитати, мені цікаво було знати, яка реальність працює, як можна сьогодні у ситуації війни готувати такі проекти, як це відбувалося, яка була роль різних гравців в музеї, і як ви змогли це все зробити. So I will, I will translate into English. Thank you. Спочатку хотіла привітати всіх в цій залі, хто виказав своє зацікавлення нашою виставкою і нашою роботою, і тим самим підтримує нас, нашу виставку і нашу країну. First of all, I want to say thank you for being here with us today and for expressing interest in the topic and in our exhibition, but more generally in, in Ukrainian art and culture. Thank you. Безумовно, ця виставка проходила в дуже важких, підготовка до цієї виставки проходила в дуже важких умовах, і це потребувало надзвичайного напруження сил всього колективу музею. Я хочу сказати, що, щоб ви зрозуміли, що багато робочого часу проходило в той момент, коли в місті не ходить транспорт, в місті немає світла, коли все припиняє роботу, все місто під час повітряної тривоги. Um, so um, Elena wants to tell us a little bit more about how uh, the whole team of the museum was involved in the preparations for the exhibition. And um, it was a collective effort from, from, from the museum. And you need to imagine that their work was um, happening at the time when there were power cuts in Kiev, so there was no electricity, public transport was not running, um, and the whole of the city was pretty much on the standstill during the air raids, um, and this is the kind of conditions that, that the team had to work with and work through um, in order to prepare for this exhibition. Маленький штрих. Якщо люди не їде на роботу на метро, і в цей час лунає повітряна тривога, і вона може у нас були випадки, коли тривога була 5 годин. So just like to give you a bit of a uh, taste, uh, for example, if, someone, if, if one of the colleagues from the museum is 
um, is going to work and they're using public transport, they're using uh, metro or, or subway um, and the air raid begins, um, they're stuck because the transport stops running and there are, there are instances when the air raids were going on for like five hours. So it's impossible to plan um, your day and the day of the, of the team uh, because it's just kind of impossible to, uh, to envision what will happen during the day. Тобто зупиняється транспорт, зупиняється метро, і метро стає а, захистом під час тривоги, і людина не може вийти з цього метро 5 годин. And so everything stops in, when, when the air raids um, are going off all over um, the city, everything stops. The metro is not running anymore. And actually the, uh, the underground stations, the metro stations, they become uh, shelters. So even if someone is not stuck in, 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 in the wagon, they, they cannot get out of the station. They have to stay there for one, two, three, four hours, however long the air raid siren is going on for. Це тільки одна маленька така замальовка, але їх таких побутових е, негараздів е, багато і вони виникають кожен день і кожен день різні. So this is just like a, a small example, but there are lots and lots of these daily details that uh, people in Kiev have to encounter um, and, and deal with. А, але попри це а, наші працівники намагалися добиратися до роботи або працювати дистанційно. Але, regardless of all these conditions, the, the employees of the museums, they were either making, doing their best to, to get to, to the museum and work on site, or they were working remotely. Деякі працівники е, в таких випадках ночували в музеї. And some of the employees were actually staying overnight at the museums and, and they slept at the museum. Щоб зранку не витрати, не витрачати час на таку дорогу, яка може стати дуже несподіваною. So, so that they, they don't have to waste the time in the morning and they can start first thing and uh, there are no um, kind of, they know what, what to expect because otherwise there are many surprises during the day. Передусім це праці реставраторів, які готували картини до виставки. So first of all, mm. we need to acknowledge the work of the uh, restorers who are actually restoring works in order for them to come here uh, to, to, to Madrid and to this exhibition. So some of the work that you will see in the exhibition, they're quite newly restored. And this was tremendous work of the restorers at the, at the museum. Роботи працівників у фондах, які так само залучені безпосередньо до роботи з картинами. And as well as that it's the work of the curators and um, the, the employees of the archive who were directly involved in the preparations for the exhibition. Ну, мені було легше, я е, більше могла працювати дистанційно, е, тому що багато роботи з текстами, з підготовчими матеріалами. Ну, я могла собі трошки більш такий вільний графік зробити і працювати ну, дійсно дистанційно. It was a little bit easier for Lana because she mainly worked with the text and kind of the, the catalog and so she could, um, she could be a bit more flexible and she could work remotely. Але ми всі намагалися бути на контакті один з одним, і такі горизонтальні комунікації дуже-дуже допомагали вчасно, інтенсивно працювати і завершити нашу підготовку вчасно, щоб роботи потрапили на цю виставку. But the whole team of the museum, they kind of collectively came together to make sure that every, all the preparations are done in time and everything is finished in time and communication was obviously key in this moment and communication was not always easy because there were such massive disruptions to, to everything, basically. I want to add one thing, because just to give you even no taste when the war started because the of the war and we discussed this with Elena and with Julia the director of the museum the first bombs exploded <clears throat> people from the museum who were all the staff of the museum who was living relatively close to the building which people who can reach the building they immediately run there and then in the end those people who were who remained in the museum basically spent the nearly two months they lived in the museum cellar because they could not leave it because you know it was not transferred it was a very difficult situation etc so they spent it's uh, solely women basically sitting in this cellar basically barricaded and uh, protecting the museum yeah. <clears throat> 
uh, what they could do if Russians could arrive, I don't know how they could protect them, but they stayed there and were sitting there. So uh, it's a really very difficult situation. It's absolutely abnormal. It's we are again coming to some kind of uh, Second World War uh, situation and stereotypes. Look, it's, 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 uh, next question I want to ask uh, uh, Irina because um, she is a director of an extremely interesting museum. It's, I think that it's one of the best museums in Kiev. Uh, unfortunately, I think that it's uh, attracting more attention abroad than at home. Uh, it's a museum of uh, theater, cinema, and musical art with unbelievable collections. Of course, here you can see part of the collection which is uh, connected to the Ukrainian avant-garde theater. But this museum is covering many other fields from, I don't know, uh, Ukrainian folk uh, kind of puppet theater, very taps, and um, uh, everything else. It's, it's a gem of uh, um, Kiev museums. Uh, but unfortunately, for many, many years, uh, they cannot receive the status of the National Museum. So it's still counted as the City Museum, when a long time ago it had to become National Museum. And я хотів би спитати пані Ірина, я вже сказав, що ви представник одного з найцікавіших музеїв в Києві. Розповість трошки про вашу колекцію, що у вас не тільки є авангард там, і е, сказав про, проблем, про проблеми, що багато років ви е, залишаєтеся міським музеєм у той так. час, коли ви е, кваліфіковані бути музеєм національним. Розкажіть, як ви готувалися і як живе ваш музей зараз, під час війни? Дякую. Добрий вечір, шановні пані і панове. Я щиро хочу подякувати організаторам, пані Франческу, пані директору Константині Акінчі і нашим українським співавторам, організаторам за цю чудову виставку, проєкт. Хочу сказати, що за 10 я прикладу. А, так, um, so, uh, пані Ірина is uh, grateful uh, to everyone for being here tonight, but she's also uh, extremely grateful to everyone who was involved in the project, Francesca and Guillermo, Marta, and the curatorial team. Я кажу це до того, що майже 10 років, 10 місяців війни, і за цей весь час якось звикаєш до того, що ти живеш от таких обставинах. Але наш український народ, наш український дух, ми не тільки живемо, ми працюємо, ми будуємо, ми співпрацюємо і приймаємо участь у таких великих, потрібних сьогодні, як і в вашій країні, так і в нашій країні проєктах. І... Um, so, uh, pa pa Irina was saying that um, obviously they have to work in extremely difficult uh, circumstances and this is something that through 10, year, 10 months of the war actually people in Ukraine got used to, but at the same time it's not just getting used to, but you um, get used to it to the point that you just work through it, like it's, it's becoming your daily reality, but you carry on with working on very important projects and this is something that uh, people in Ukraine are kind of remarkable about because uh, everyone just carries on with with their work and um, was doing important projects like like this one and collaborating on the international level. Так, я вчора гуляла вечірнім Мадридом і знаєте, щось таке в душі перевернулося. Отже, можуть люди в 21 столітті жити світло, вода, так гарно, так весело, взагалі, начебто приїжджаєш в інший куточок, і потім ти знаєш, що тобі треба повертатися і знову повертатися в ту ситуацію, яка зараз на нас накладена. Пані Олена сказала, ну, ми можемо про це говорити довго, але я думаю, що ці люди... Тобто ми, українці, які це все переживаємо, ми стаємо сильнішими, відповідальнішими. І я впевнена, що наші музейники, які роблять ну, героїчну справу, тому що ми всі на своєму фронті. 
ми зберігаємо культуру. Uh, so uh, Irena was walking around uh, Madrid uh, last night and it was kind of surreal because it, it just felt like there is no war, like everything was very jolly and there were lights on everywhere and the atmosphere was quite festive and it kind of, it felt, as I say, like extremely surreal because uh, the, the situation back home in Ukraine is completely different, but um, it, it makes Ukrainians stronger, it makes us more creative, it makes us more resilient. And um, museum workers, they're also fighting their own kind of battleground, so to say. So they, they're kind of, they're doing their, they're, they're contributing to the war effort um, in, in their way, which is also extremely important. З першого дня війни наш музей працює, працює, зберігаючи колекцію. Коли не було можливості, були взриви, були ракети. Ми все одно, фондовики наші, зберігачі їздили на роботу. Хто не міг доїхати, тому що транспорт майже не ходив. Якщо сказати, він ходив, то люди добралися пішки для того, щоб зберегти, зберегти те, що є дійсно національним надбанням нашої країни. And so the, the theater museum, it also continued to work from, from the first day of war and all of the workers continue to get uh, to the museum to ensure that the, the works that they have in their collection are preserved, they're protected, they're taking to safety as much as possible. And some of the employees, they because the, as we mentioned before, the, the situation with public transport is sometimes quite difficult, but they, they would walk to work and it kind of sometimes it's not a very um, short journey because Kiev is quite a big city, but they were determined to come and to make sure that they are continuing doing their job and that they are, they're there to protect, uh, to protect the, the collection. Прийшла десь кінець травня, початок червня. Ну, я чесно скажу, що вагалися, тому що ми думали, що ми повинні зберігати це вдома. Це наше, українське. Але ми все-таки посиділи, поговорили, і, як казав наш перший директор Петро Іванович Рулін, треба не тільки зберігати, поповнювати, але треба ще давати цьому все життя. Ну і питання постало, щоб тільки організувати цю поїздку, запакувати і доїхати. І ми знаємо, що коли це все відбувалося, то знову на Київ летіли ракети, які бомбили наші ТЕС. Не було світла, не було води. Ну, звісно, був хаос і тому було складно. Але, як кажуть, слава Богу, so when when the museum was approached to to participate and to collaborate on this project, Pani Irina has to be honest that they hesitated for, for, for some time because they thought that their job was to protect, to preserve and to protect the works. And so they kind of saw that there is a risk with taking them out of the country and kind of shipping them uh, during kind of through the territory of, of the country that was in war. Um, but um, kind of they discussed it with the team and they realized that yes, their job is to preserve and to protect, but their job is also to share and to bring these works to life. And it's only through um, showing uh, works in, in, in exhibition and sharing them with wider audiences that uh, they can actually make that happen. And so um, kind of once they reached the decision, it was kind of, um, they completely signed up to it after that. Good. Yes. Uh, we don't have too much time yes. left. And before Katya will tell us about our work and preparation of this exhibition, I want to make very short comments. Because the next panel will be dedicated to the cultural deal for your praise. And this deal is really needed because uh, I think that this war is uh, changing the equation. And even people inside the country can see that we need massive reforms in different fields, including, including cultural field, including museum field. And uh, basically the war demonstrated not only strengths, but demonstrated serious shortcomings like the absence of um, united digital catalog of the holding of Ukrainian museums, which we were talking about for years and years and years, but which never was realized. 
there are creations with equipment of museum. There are creations with training of museum personnel, which could be provided through European Union help by different European countries. So there are massive needs. And uh, I hope that uh, uh, this heroic conduct of Ukrainian museum officials will be noticed. And I hope that uh, Europeans will make steps uh, and extend some help, share know-how which is absent, uh, help to re-equip these museums and to push them in the direction of the future which they deserve. Uh, now, uh, Katya will tell a few words about how we were working on this exhibition, because uh, in reality it started in a very strange way, because we met in Venice, I was asked by Katya's advisor to uh, give her some direction with her PhD thesis, and uh, in the first days of the war, we met in Venice, and I immediately understood that I need Katya in this project. And she was absolutely irreplaceable. Uh, uh, she was, um, uh, she proved to be not very only gifted young art historian, but very good organizer, uh, which uh, obviously was needed uh, for us when we are in such short time, we're um, trying to realize uh, this massive undertaking. Uh, you can understand, and uh, Guillermo and Marta will tell you that people are not doing exhibitions of such size in four months. Uh, people and Julian will tell you that uh, Tempton Hudson usually is not publishing huge books mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, in three months. So it was a common effort of different institutions, companies to do undoable, to uh, basically to race with time. I am surprised, but we won this race. Usually we are losing them. So please, Katya, tell. Thanks, Konstantin. I think you kind of answered the question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, as Konstantin is saying, um, it was uh, an extremely short timeline, but also what made it a little bit more complicated is that we're working, we were working in parallel on the catalog, which is a catalog for the exhibition, but it's also a broader publication. It includes uh, many more artists and many more features that are not, we didn't have the space to, to put on um, in, in the rooms. But, um, and then at the same time, we were also planning um, this uh, show, which is uh, kind of now works out to be a multi-venue show, multiple institutions are involved, lots and lots of um, individuals provided us assistance and support and just goodwill for us to make this project. But I think you know, it was very important to us from the start when we started discussing the show that we definitely absolutely have to have works from Ukrainian museums. And that was because on the one hand that kind of meant that we will take works into kind of out of Ukraine and into safety and B, we will share the diversity and richness that we have in our Ukrainian museums that are not particularly well known in the West and will show the treasures that we have there. Um, and so that kind of was another very important um, aspect and we're super, super happy that we actually managed to, to do that, to achieve that. Um, and I think another very important thing for us was to show how um, interesting and dynamic this period was for Ukraine. Uh, obviously we have to, um, it's kind of, it's a very complicated context and it's a very turbulent period in, in time, but we wanted to show that Ukraine had its own moment. Um, it had it, its own culture, it had its own art, which was extremely, again, I'll use the word diverse, extremely diverse. There were all different cultures coming together, but it, it was something that was very uniquely Ukrainian, regardless of all the kind of links with, with the West and, and the East. And that's why uh, we wanted to have quite a broad representation of artists and styles in the exhibition. And for those of you who haven't seen it already, uh, you, when you have a chance, you will see that kind of we, the visual language um, of the exhibition, it changes as you go through the rooms and there are multiple uh, styles and multiple movements that are represented that are very different. Uh, but that's something that we were super keen to show is that 
yes, there were radical art movements, there were less radical art movements, but they all coexisted and um, they all, the artists were working together at the same time and in Ukraine, this is the most important aspect. They were working on the territory of what today in Ukraine, they were engaging with elements of Ukrainian folk art, of Ukrainian decorative art, with our local traditions. And that's what makes it distinctly um, Ukrainian um, and something that we want to celebrate, to, to share with the international audience and to celebrate. I want to add only one word, because of course there, is a, there are many discussions now uh, what is Ukrainian art, what is not Ukrainian art. They are not appropriating um, artists who were not part of Ukrainian uh, school. We are, in the same time, of course, we are including in this uh, narrative of Ukrainian modernism artists who spent even some time in Ukraine but left imprint on Ukrainian um, uh, cultural landscape. Like, for example, this, um, uh, you know, classical example of Kazimir Malevich. Yeah, so seven cities uh, claimed Homer <laughs> dead. Uh, uh, of course, Malevich is an ethnic Pole. Malevich spent a lot of his creative life in Russia. But for Graham, he is extremely uh, important, not only because he was born and uh, spent his childhood uh, in Kyiv and near Kyiv, but late in his life when situation in Russia became already frozen, he was invited to Kyiv, he came to teach in the Kyiv Art Institute and he got his refuge, uh, respect, possibility to work, possibility to publish, and of course influence a myriad of young artists, because of course he was very important and that's his place in the history of Ukrainian art. And also his, uh, his last uh, private ex like public exhibition happened in Kiev, which is also a very important um, aspect. Sorry, Constantine. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that, uh, you will see the exhibition. You will uh, make your own opinion on it. Uh, we tried. We did what we can. <laughs> But now I want to talk uh, not about visual arts, not only about visual arts, but about Ukrainian cinema. And those of you who will uh, buy the catalog, where you will see that one chapter of this catalog is dedicated to Ukraine, Ukrainian cinematic avant-garde. We hope that one of parts of this exhibition will be cultural program which will, be for, which will be focused on uh, Ukrainian cinema of 1920s and 1930s. And uh, we have probably one of the most functional cultural institutions in the country, which is called the uh, Dobzhenka Center, which uh, was established to deal with uh, cinematic legacy of Ukraine. And I think that Elena can tell you about this much better than I, but before she will start to speak, I think that we can see this Trailer. short video, which will give you some taste or some, it's a really teaser. Uh, First, I want uh, 
to um, express my great, great uh, respect uh, to my Ukrainian colleagues for you could done in uh, these hard circumstances. Uh, and the uh, National Art Museum as my first uh, museum where I started museum career and museum of uh, theater and cinema art. Uh, there were two places which I was worrying a lot about. Um, thank you for your job and your devotion to a profession. Um, and I am also very happy uh, to uh, Museums for Ukraine, to Francesca and to Konstantin for making this boiling pot together, for uh, getting us all together. Because now it's, uh, it's really time uh, and it was time many years ago to speak about Ukrainian art uh, avant-garde. Uh, um, art of uh, visual arts, I mean painting, uh, drawing, um, typographics, uh, and also cinema, uh, they were very uh, stick together in the uh, 20s. Uh, and uh, they were like uh, infecting uh, each other uh, with ideas. And cinema was uh, the art uh, which reflected uh, the desire for uh, technologies, for uh, industrial. Uh, industrialization, it uh, pushed uh, uh, and influenced uh, everything that happened in the 20s. Uh, it was a period of great enthusiasm and the feeling of new life coming. Uh, and uh, our researchers say that uh, the symbol of uh, Ukrainian avant-garde, it was a tractor <laughs> uh, which entered uh, the uh, Ukrainian villages uh, like uh, the uh, train uh, entered uh, uh, La Ciota, uh, and uh, that was the beginning of uh, world cinematography. So for Ukraine, uh, uh, cinematography starts with right, the right. Uh, coming <laughs> of the uh, tractor. Um, and even in the propaganda text, uh, uh, it was written that uh, the tractor uh, will um, dig not only ground, but minds of people. Uh, and it uh, looks like it really happened in 10 years. The minds uh, were really uh, stand from the legs to their head. Uh, and it ended tragically in, uh, in the la uh, late, uh, early 30s. But uh, Ukraine had that uh, 10 years of uh, um, great energy. Uh, which was pushing art. Um, and uh, if we speak about uh, cinematographic scene, um, it, it was much influenced and it was based on uh, painting, uh, on uh, writers, uh, on theater. It was born from uh, Les Kurbas and uh, his uh, theater. And there was a, a unique organization, we call it WUFKU, uh, All Ukrainian Photo Cinema Administration, which united uh, different uh, artists from different spheres. Um, and uh, they had eight years of uh, working out uh, about 160 uh, feature films. Um, it uh, does not concern uh, animation. Uh, scientific or uh, propaganda uh, chronicles. But from that uh, 160 films, 57% uh, 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 supposed to be lost. Mm -hmm. And our work of uh, Dovzhanko Center as a film archive is uh, continuing all the time, uh, trying to find uh, these movies and we find them uh, in Germany, in Argentina, uh, in Japan, and today I was meeting uh, with our colleagues from uh, uh, Filmoteca, and I asked them probably we have uh, uh, also Spanish links, because uh, Ukraine in 20s, uh, 100 years ago, uh, it has uh, strong links uh, with uh, foreign uh, institutions, cinema, it was a period of uh, distribution, so it was Ukrainian uh, Hollywood. And unfortunately, uh, and which was happened also to the art uh, we see now in the exposition in the 30s, especially uh, 36, uh, 38, uh, the art uh, uh, was uh, closed uh, in the resource. 
uh, in some of them uh, it was uh, ruined um, uh, i mean uh, leave uh, special reserve but in national art museum uh, they uh, uh, they preserved it it was a period when the art was uh, covered um, and uh, I got an honor to, uh, to be a witness uh, when uh, in uh, 2016 uh, or 2015, uh, this exhibition was first presented to public. And now uh, uh, the world can see it uh, uh, here in Madrid. And I feel these fluctuations bef behind this work, uh, behind these pictures. And um, I'm very proud of um, the uh, museum people uh, who uh, really uh, preserve it. Um, there is a story in our circles uh, about the first director of museum, Bileshivsky, uh, during uh, World, uh, first World War I. Uh, he stayed in Kyiv um, and uh, it was winter, it was cold winter without uh, electricity, warmness, uh, water very similar to what happens today, but in 100 years, uh, but there was no internet. Uh, and uh, many people emigrated and they left their houses uh, with uh, uh, collections of art. And he took uh, sledges and he was uh, walking through these houses uh, and collected uh, icons or pictures and brought them to the museum. And in this way, he saved uh, um, many pieces of art. So uh, it, it's a legend, but uh, it's really a, an example for us, which uh, holds us uh, a lot. Um, so I guess that in spring we, uh, we can see the uh, film program. Um, uh, we are starting to, uh, to pick the best films to show uh, art of cinematography and um, a lecture program, what was happening, uh, because uh, cinema uh, managed to fix uh, some process that it's impossible to put on painting. Uh, but uh, have a great time in this exhibition uh, and thank you for your support. I have 10 minutes. Yeah, so um, uh, basically wrapping up this panel, we don't need even 10 minutes. I think that we can wrap it much faster and representing curatorial group, which is sitting here. I want to um, uh, do what other people did and I had no chance to do it. Uh, first, I have to express my gratitude to Francesca because this project happened in a sense, because we knew each other. <laughs> and uh, it was very interesting because when war started, uh, Francesca contacted me and we started to think what to do, which uh, gave the beginning to the WhatsApp group, Museums for Ukraine, which now has more than 100 uh, active um, users. But in that moment, it was like five people or four people when we were starting these conversations. And uh, one of the things which uh, I discussed with Francesca is possibility to do this exhibition. I wanted to do this exhibition for a very long time. And I have to say that all the time it was connected with some political upheavals. <laughs> because in 2016, this exhibition had to go to Hungary and to be shown in the Ludwig Museum in Budapest. Uh, and it was a grand plan because we wanted to have two floors, one floor with contemporary art and one floor with modern art. And it's a beautiful space. Everything was decided. And literally two months before the exhibition, uh, it was a clash between uh, Ukrainians and uh, Orban government, or actually Orban decided to use his disagreement with Ukrainians as a card um, during his election campaign and Hungarians froze any financial operations, governmental financial operation uh, with Ukraine, including insurance for our exhibition. 
So it was practical event. We took the contemporary art exhibition, which was very successful. We did not have one Hungarian official at the opening, but we had ambassador of United States, United Kingdom, France, Germany, etc. Like uh, NATO minus Hungary, I can say. <laughs> that we did. Okay, I decided that if it did not work in Hungary, maybe our German friends will be receptive. And in that moment, I offered um, uh, this exhibition to one German museum, but not Cologne, <laughs> <laughs> not the one, which I will not name. Uh, we came to the director of this museum, we sent all materials, and she told us without blinking that it's very good, it's extremely interesting, but she will not do this exhibition for that simple reason that it will offend her Russian partners. <laughs> And Russian partners will be not happy and it will damage your relations with Russia. So that was another manifestation. So they said third time, third trial, which we did during the war, finally worked. And I'm very grateful to Francesca. I'm expressing your uh, my gratitude and admiration because it's uh, this undertaking. Uh, really demanded a lot of efforts and a lot of energy. But then I want to uh, express my endless gratitude to Guillermo, to Marta. Working with them was absolute pleasure. Katya already mentioned this already, but I want to talk not only about them. Uh, I want to talk about all people in the museum and especially about museum workers who were helping us to hand this exhibition. It was unbelievable manifestation of professionalism. And they were so creative <laughs> that in few cases, they gave us the idea how to exhibit paintings. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Francesca. Thank you, Guillermo. Thank you, Marta. Uh, we are very happy that this dream which looked absolutely insane in <laughs> April. Which, it was absolutely a real idea that we can take this exhibition. Uh, when I started to talk with Elena, when we started to talk on this book, it, it was at the best unrealistic. Uh, when we had the first exchange with Sophie Thompson about this book, it was not fully realistic either, but we did it. And I am grateful to everybody who took part in this complicated project. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I think we want to do some questions if there are any questions. Questions, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> any questions? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> When I look at the years 1900 to 1930, that's a very short period of time. And on my understanding from the Dozhenko Institute, from the National Museum of Ukraine, from the National Theater Museum and Theater Music, is that you have huge holdings. And these are only the ones that, that were rescued during the Stalinist campaign of humiliation of this movement. How, how can you describe the incredible output of these artists at that time? And second, you know, how many of them worked in different disciplines? Because I've been seeing theater sets by Müller. I, you know, there are so many crossovers. Did the, a lot of that take place? So please describe actually a little bit, give us a glimpse at how this world of avant-garde oh, manifested itself in Ukraine. Yeah. Um, thank you, Francesca. Yes, it was an extremely um, vibrant uh, period. And as Olena mentioned, it was, uh, was a period when artists, writers, theater directors, cinema directors, they were all working together and they were influencing each other and kind of stimulating the development uh, of art during this time. And kind of there were obviously 
kind of there was a, a, quite a lot of movements through through Ukraine as well. So artists would work. So Meller, for example, he became like he started working in Kiev. Then he kind of moved with Kurbas to Kharkiv. Many artists who were working in Kharkiv then went to Odessa to work at the Odessa Film Factory. So it was kind of movements through through the country, but they were also kind of in, like they were constantly. Um, in communication and kind of influencing each other, stimulating each other, but they were also exposed and they kind of they actively sought to see what was happening in, in the wider world. So they were extremely connected to, um, uh, to what was happening in, in Western Europe in particular. And it's only in the 30s when kind of the, the curtain started to fall. But in, in the 20s, it was an extreme kind of period when artists and film directors and theater directors, they could travel to the vast. They were reading Western uh, journals and art magazines, and they were kind of very much exposed to what was happening to all the developments, to all the radical developments and progressive art developments that were happening in the vast. And they actively worked with that. They integrated it in their art practice. They worked with each other. Um, and yes, as you're saying, kind of, it, it, it is a fantastic kind of dynamic period, and it's only to be honest, I think in our exhibition, we're only talking about 20 years. So we kind of we have works from 1910s until I think the last work that we have in the set, in the show is from 1928. So it's kind of it's extremely short. It's like nothing um, compared in the in the grand scheme of I, things. I just wanted one word because it was, of course, two sides street. Because, uh, for example, some Western uh, important Western um, uh, cultural figures who are working in Ukraine. And Elena uh, knows this better than I. When Piscator came to the Odessa Film Studio, when Lota Lenya came to Odessa Film Studio, unfortunately, as I understood, this film did not survive. Mm -hmm. As unfortunately, it did not survive um, uh, uh, some, uh, film set, which uh, was it was a Dix who do, did them. I don't remember now, but one of the important German expressionists. So, on the other hand, what Francesca is noticed, we have this kind of very liquid borders of techniques and genres. So, a painter could do um, uh, theater designs or graphic design, or for example, Dabrzenka, who is the most important probably Ukrainian film director of this period, in the same time was producing film poster as an art, artist. So they are really jumping, they are really changing roles uh, constantly, which is very interesting. This liquidity of genres is very interesting characteristic of the period. <laughs> 